Hey there, LGBTQ politics. Um, this is going to be a relatively brief lecture to go over the Osterberg Keel reading on Pink Links, visualizing the LGBTQ network. So let's dive right in. Uh, we need, as a foundation to understand this piece, a pretty clear understanding of transnationalism. So transnationalism is the idea that ideas, concepts, tactics, strategies, even laws, sometimes spread from one country to another. Now, scholars like Coleman have really thought about this in terms of activists. Similarly, uh, scholars like Ayub have looked at how activists themselves migrating from one place to another can lead to sharing of both norms, but also strategies or tactics. More broadly, though, we can also think about the way organizations links across countries can lead to norm spreading. So if we have a norm that the thing to fight for is marriage equality, then that spreads from one state to another and puts things like civil unions or domestic registration systems as less than or not really what the goal is. Similarly, if we take seriously the notions that uh, equality has to mean something like an anti-discrimination law, then and that the way to achieve that is through the courts, then that norm, but also that strategy spreads from one place to another. So we want to think about not just the activists spreading from one place or visiting different places or organizations bridging across different countries, but the way in which that has serious implications for what activism looks like and what the goals of the movement are. So what Pink Link seeks to do is move from just thinking about this or talking about it in terms of specific activists or looking at the norms and whether or not the norms in one place exist in another to look at how that spread happens and really which organizations are having the most influence in this spread. Now, the way Pink Links tries to do this is to think about it in terms of the internet. Why? Well, because the internet is one of the fastest ways to connect transnationally that also encourages spread not just regionally, so from one country to its neighbor, but also globally. Now, we want to think about which organizations have the greatest influence because that's going to shape what rights LGBTQ organizations fight for and also the strategies and tactics that I just mentioned. A good example of this would be whether or not marriage equality is the goal. So we can think about the way in which an organization like the COC in the Netherlands, where marriage equality has been prevalent for a while, the way in which the influence of that organization spreading to other European states have really encouraged states to shift from domestic partnerships or civil registration like the French PAC system to really marriage equality. We can also think about this in terms of what kind of strategies or tactics. So in terms of thinking about strategies, the assimilationist strategy has been really effective in places like the Netherlands and the United States. And so often we see those that strategy or that perception and set of norms spreading from those states to states where LGBTQ rights are less well developed. Think Far East Asia, parts of Latin America, and parts of Africa. All right, so why hyperlink analysis? Well, the first thing we need to think about is how well does hyperlink analysis actually mirror the transnational advocacy on the ground. We're on the ground. What I really mean is just in real life. Um, and then the other thing we need to think about is do specific transnational, does, does transnational activism networks actually matter to what happens? I'll start with the first question first. So how well does it mirror? Well, it does a pretty good job. A lot of other scholars have supported it and you read a little bit about that in the reading. But we also want to acknowledge that organizations might not always have who they're connected to clearly visible on their websites. So if anything, this is a conservative estimate. 
those states that show up as really pro or those organizations that show up as really prominent are probably even more prominent than they appear. Um, whereas what it's going to underestimate are some states that might be more behind the scenes prominent, might not show up as important as they actually are. So let's use this to think about now, does the Transnational Advocacy Network or TAN actually matter? Well, we argue, yeah, it certainly does. Because if these international organizations are playing a substantial role um, across a bunch of different regions, then that's gonna create a homogenization of the movement. But if we see really strong regional differences, then we would expect the regions themselves to have strong and independent LGBTQ movements. So let's take a look at what the LGBT Transnational Advocacy Network actually looks like a little bit. So before I dive totally into the images, a little bit about the methods. Um, hyperlink analysis, as I explained before, is this way of measuring the linkages between organizations through analyzing the linking that they do on their website. So if I have a website and I put on my website a link to NEC's website and a link to um, the Human Rights Campaign website and a link to, let's say, my Facebook page, then all of those would show up in a hyperlink analysis as links between me and those different websites. Now, if those websites linked back to me, then it would look like a reciprocal relationship. And in a minute, we're gonna look at the maps and you'll see that when you have lines where there's arrows at both ends. But if they don't link back, then I end up with just a one directional link. Now, the way I do this is through a program called Issue Crawler that's specifically designed to look not just at the page itself, but to look at the, HT, the underlying HTML for a website in order to pull every single link possible. And there are a couple ways we could do this through what's called Interactor or Colink. Most of what you all read was Colink, but if you're more interested in this, I'm happy to go over the differences. So why Issue Crawler? A little bit more about this. Um, in Interactor, edges are always reciprocal, so A links to B, B links to A. Um, Colink, A links to C, and B links to C, that makes it more important. So implicitly, what we're looking at is um, a way to measure how important it is, and we want a slightly higher threshold. So part of what our goal was, was to make sure that we were not including in this network, say, right-wing backlash organizations that link to these um, international LGBT organizations as a way of critique. The other thing is that you all need to know where we got our websites from. So our starting point was through the International Lesbian and Gay Association list. They're a clearinghouse where any LGBTQ organization can register with ILGA and become part of this global network. So let's take a look at some of the maps themselves. We've already looked at this complete network before, and I went over a little bit about what you're actually reading. Remember that the color coding differentiates what the uh, ending is on any link. So we have blue representing organizational links, where gray represents links that are clearly from the UK. Color coding helps us see a little bit about what different types of organizations are involved in the network. The other thing to pay close attention to is that the size of the circle indicates how much linking is happening to that particular organization. So organizations with really small circles are not being connected to nearly as much as ones with much larger circles. So who's prominent when we look at it globally? Well, the first thing that might be interesting to look at is that even in the global network, the sub page for the International Lesbian Gay Association Europe is really prominent, as are a lot of European organizations. What we don't see a lot of are organizations that are based in the global south. The other important thing to think about is the way in which we see some organizations that are not explicitly LGBTQ. Things like Amnesty International also appear in this network, meaning that LGBTQ issues are hitting the websites not of just 
queer identified organizations, but also broader human rights organizations. Interestingly, when we see websites from Latin America in particular on this network, they tend to be websites that are promoting not necessarily specifically LGBTQ rights, but sexuality and reproductive rights in general. So let's take a closer look first at Europe. Um, for the rest of this slideshow, I'm mostly going to announce just which map you're looking at, and I encourage you to pause on each of these to take a closer look, thinking about the following questions. Who is prominent and who's not prominent? Which actors or organizations are really close together and who's really far apart? And what does this tell you about who might be dictating the norms in this particular region? So now we're looking at the Africa map. And for this map, I want you to think about not just which organizations, but whether or not these organizations are based in Africa. I'll just point to one as an example. So HRW.org is Human Rights Watch. That's an international organization that's not necessarily based in Africa, but instead is based in the global north, and yet is really prominent. Some other prominent global north organizations are the Ford Foundation, um, the Soros Foundation, and we see those pretty prominent in this network also. In Asia, we find some similar things to Africa. So again, I want you to look at who's prominent and think about what does it mean for LGBTQ people and LGBTQ activists in Africa and Asia that organizations that are not in the region are so prominent. If we're seeing more of organizations like UN Women, that means that the United Nations is dictating the agenda and dictating it from a gendered perspective, not necessarily indigenous queer people. Now we're looking at the ANZAP, which remember is Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the South Asian Pacific, like Papua New Guinea. For this one, I want you to look closely at uh, the prevalence of .orgs in our network. First of all, most of them are Australian government websites. And second, looks like they're pretty prominent. In fact, overall, Australian organizations are much more dominant than New Zealand or other Pacific Island organizations. Let's take a look at South America. And I mentioned this briefly when I was looking at the complete network, but in uh, South America, what we see a lot of are organizations that are more focused on gender justice in general. So what I'd like you to do for this map is take a second to actually look at a few of these websites. Uh, use Google Translator if the website you're looking at is in Spanish and take a look at what kinds of things are they advocating for. Is this specifically LGBTQ rights or are we really looking more broadly at sexuality, gender justice, or even reproductive rights? Last but certainly not least is looking at our own region, North America. And the first thing you should notice is it looks like there are two totally different groups. So what characterizes these different groups? Who is kind of in the one at the bottom and what kinds of organizations are in the one at the top? Pay close attention to that, and that's part of what I want you to reflect on in your blog.